This is episode 110, recorded January 8th, 2016. Funky Bunky Boom Boom. Hey everyone, thank you for joining me again for another episode of the Donovan Adkisson Show. Uh, and in this episode, I have two very special co-hosts with me tonight. Uh, I have Mr. Samuel Lewis with the Samcast Network at uh, tscn.tv. And I have Mr. Oliver Banta, who is a health IT professional. Hey guys, how's it going? Going good. It's great. Friday night. <laughs> Friday night. Yeah, we're uh, we're doing something a little different here, and we're actually recording this on a Friday evening. Maybe we can make it a thing. I don't know. We'll see. But this... It may, it may last more than two months, I know, so we'll you, see. <laughs> you know what? You know what? When you said, you know, pre-show that you had something that you were going to say, I knew exactly what it was. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, trust me, I have a lot of false starts in my life. So, you know, that that is a a, a dig well deserved. So no But Sam, no. I have commitment issues too, so Well, I'm glad he said it, not me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well hopefully as you can tell, we're all good friends here. So um mm. sometimes there's there's a little bit of the uh, Man, I hate even saying this now because it's so close to your name. I mean, there's a lot of banter. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> oh, God. Never mind. Mm. Well, well, I like he's never and, heard and, that before. <laughs> and the, well, and the definition of banter, though, Donovan, is witty conversation. And I don't know if I'd go that far. I know. I keep trying to pull you guys <laughs> up. So anyway, how about we talk about some technology? That might work. Yeah. Um, Please. <laughs> well, we we have a, uh, a hodgepodge of topics that we can talk about tonight. So, uh, Sam, do you have you got anything of interest that you want to lead off with? Yeah, I've got several things I kind of want to talk about tonight. But th there is one that I want to kind of bring up to start us off. I think it'd make an interesting little conversation, considering that all of us here use Twitter, various amounts of Twitter, but still all of us use Twitter. Um, according to Recode, Twitter is considering a 10,000 character limit for tweets. Now, what this actually means, if you read through the article, and a lot of people are missing this, by the way, um, is that which they're already got they already have that limit for direct messages right now so if you direct message someone then you can use that many characters makes sense makes it a bit more useful yeah. than 140 characters for personal messages uh but the thing about this is that most sources are saying that if they were to do this it would be set up to where you would still see just the 140 characters but if it would sort of say something like this tweet is longer or something like that. Um, so you could then select it and read the rest of the tweet if you wanted to. So this in no way would be doing the thing that most people are afraid of, which is suddenly turning your Twitter feed, which is nice and succinct, into a huge wall of text. Because that many characters is – some people can milk a couple of paragraphs out of that many <laughs> characters. Uh, so that's the thing most people are afraid of is that it will suddenly turn their tweet, their wall into a wall of text. Um, but what do, what do you guys think about the idea of them breaking the 140 and actually doing 10,000 now? Uh, Oliver, you go first. Sure. Uh, you know, I don't mind it. I, I don't know why people are so worked up about it because I think the, the usefulness will have to, I guess, be seen when they show how that expansion of the 140 to the expanded content is going to be. It sure sounds like they're trying to keep folks within the walled garden of Twitter. Because right now you have a lot of folks who do, 
you know, uh, some text, then a link to an external website, an external resource, video, etc. And then you leave Twitter when you go there. So I think it seems like they're, they're trying to get, you know, keep people in inside the Twitter uh, ecosystem, similar to how Facebook does it with embedded content. Um, but again, with the, the, the you know, expanded uh, messages, I, I guess I don't see a huge problem with it. Yeah, I, I don't either. Um, I think they they already kind of somewhat messaged everybody, if you will, that something like this was probably on the horizon when they went to a 10,000 character limitation on the direct messaging. Um, you know, at the beginning, it was 140 for DMs as well as Twitter messages. So I think that was just one step toward this. They were getting everybody comfortable with that. And, um, and I think if I'm not mistaken, the direct messages work very uh, similarly to the way Sam was describing how it would actually work in the feed, where you don't necessarily get, you know, if someone decides that they want to uh, write a novella, you don't get 5,000 uh, characters in the DM, you get the, the first bit, and then you can expand it or whatever. Uh, I think that's the way it works. I, I can't say for sure because nobody's really sent me DM messages that long. Um, but with that said, I think it's, I think it's good, um, especially with the fact that it's, it's not going to actually flood the, the, uh, the news feed. I mean, that would be ridiculous. I mean, you couldn't make heads or tails of anything if that were the case. But to go ahead and give you 140 characters and then like a read more or whatever, I mean, honestly, that's the way most of our blog sites work. You know, mm. you, you get a little summary, and then if you want to read more, you click the, the Read More button. And you got to keep in mind, number one, uh, like Oliver mentioned, I mean, there's the Facebook aspect of it. Twitter is trying to fight against Facebook because Facebook is already more of a, a long-form medium when it comes to post posting messages. And, of course, the way it does it is it summarizes and actually has a, a link to expand it, or it will actually open up in another window, um, but people were already taking long-form posts uh, and doing screenshots and then adding those to the tweet. So it, it, was, it was basically something that is needed, I believe, and, and I don't think it's going to break Twitter. I think it can only make it better. So. I- my biggest concern, though, with regards to that kind of change in philosophy is if the majority of posts just become headlines and mm. everything is expanded. And so now, you know, right now in my timeline, sure, there's links to content, etc. But, you know, a lot, I guess if, if basically if a uh, an account on Twitter just does headlines that go somewhere else, I unfollow them because I, I don't, that's not how I use Twitter. Um, right. So if everyone starts using it that way, uh, my experience with Twitter will fundamentally change. The main, the main thing with me and Twitter is that every now and then I run out of like two characters. So I don't think I would be using that many characters to type something out. But it would be nice to have a little bit over 140 at least because, uh, let's see, a picture automatically takes... I think at least 14 characters, they don't make it the full length, but same with links. Links only take up a default number of characters. So it would be nice to have a little bit more that way. If I cross post, cause I'm going to be honest, I post the same thing on both uh, or on all three Twitter, Facebook, and Google plus, because I don't have time to compose them for the different platforms. I'm kind of lazy that way. <laughs> Uh, or kind of busy that way, however you want to put it. Um, <laughs> You're just utilizing the resources that are available to you. Yeah, exactly. So sometimes my other things get neglected and get smaller posts because I had to make it good for Twitter. You know, so it it will be nice to be able to be flexible that way. Does it mean? Does it mean I'm going to start posting several paragraphs? Heck no, I never do that. But having a bit more than 140 characters so I can do things like that properly. Yeah, it's going to be good in my content creation side of things. I think I wouldn't have gone 
I, I wouldn't have jumped straight to 10,000. I probably would have expanded to like 250. And there was, I, I, I can't even call it a competing service because I can't even remember the name of it now. But, you know, about two years ago, I joined one and it was supposed to be a Twitter competitor. And one of the mm. things that they did was they, they expanded. It's either 250 or 450 characters. Are you talking uh, about AppNet? Mm, no, 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 no. That's uh, that that's familiar, but every time I go to talk about this one, I can never remember it, and then I have to, I have to, uh, I have to uh, uh, research and and whatever just to, and then it's like, oh yeah, I remember that because it had a cool name. It was like, you know, we've got Twitter, and no, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not Elo. Uh, Elo's not been around two years, but um, I forget it. It's, it's. I almost want to call it like it's peaky or pokey or some crap like that. But anyway, mm. yeah. Web two point names. You can't remember them half the time. <laughs> I know, right? And and it'll you know it might come to me after after we're done here. So, but it's not a big deal. Uh, the the right. point is, I probably would not have have gone to 10,000. I would have gone to like 250 or maybe 450. And uh, because, I mean, Twitter's got to evolve. It's got to change. I mean, the tw the Twitter of today is not the Twitter of two years ago or even four years ago. I mean, I, I, I remember Andy Anako having a conversation on one of the shows that he does. It may, it may, have be, may even be his uh, Anako's Almanac that he does on 5 by 5 But he was talking about that the way he used to use Twitter, he no longer uses it because it's no longer informative. It's no longer where you can actually have short little conversations with little blurbs. It's unfortunately, it's more about, hey, learn how to make thousands of dollars on YouTube or <laughs> come on over here and let me teach you how to do social media. And are you a podcaster? Well, if you're not, you want to be, I mean, that's pretty much yeah. all I see now. It's either that or it's the political commentary. And the political commentary to me is actually more entertaining. <laughs> On Twitter? Yeah. Um, I don't see any of that, but I'm following, you know, pretty specific individuals or groups that uh, are, you know, focused on the interests I'm looking for. Well, yeah, mm. sure, sure. And and it it suits your needs, whereas... You know, my scope is probably, I won't say it's broader, but it's definitely different. I mean, I do follow some technical people, but I also follow uh, conservative and uh, liberal uh, pundits and what have you on Twitter. Um, I'm just, I'm, I'm curious about everything that they have to say because I like to see the conflicting viewpoints and... Mm. Uh, and, and of course, podcasters. And you know, I follow people like Andrew Zarian and uh, Paul Thorat and all those guys. So, mm. um, but unfortunately, I do follow some people that are in the social media circle, and that's pretty much all I ever see is about, hey, come here, watch my video. Let me let me show you how to do this. Yes, feed. Thank you. Uh, and that is that. That's our producer in the chat. Anyway, he brought it up. Yep. Feed. So, um, is it even still active? It's p h e e d dot com. I had never heard of it. Really? Me neither. My wife and I both have accounts on there, but I don't. I don't know if it's. Let me see. Um. Well, when you go to feed dot com, now it goes to. Okay, it shows you the app. Do you want to log in? No, not right now, because I probably can't remember. <laughs> what my login is. And this would probably predates. Oh, never mind. <laughs> Thank you, LastPass. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. If you, matter of fact, if you go to feed.com slash GDA, that's P H E E D dot com slash GDA, you will actually see an embedded video. Of the South Geek show. Ah. With one good looking guy on the left and some nerdy looking dude on the right. <laughs> oh, weird. It must be flipped on your screen. 
<laughs> oh, okay. Is that it? Yeah, that happens. That does happen. <laughs> the thing is, I was sitting here trying to figure out, now, which one of us is it? Is it the Oliver era or the Samuel era? I don't know which one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, posted September 30th, 2014. So anyway, um, got a little sidetracked there, but I, I guess the point is, is there's you you can look at these things like this and say, well, that's that's not really a viable competitor. Well, whether it is or whether it isn't, it's still active. Elo, you know, Elo is supposed to be a competitor to Facebook. I hate it. I can <laughs> never see how it would ever be a competitor uh, to Facebook. So uh, I think it. I think it already had its fifteen minutes of fame. Yeah, uh -huh. I, I think you're right. I, yeah, I think it's pretty much done. I logged into it a couple of times. And, uh, well, hello, 1990s web design. <laughs> <laughs> like, it, you know, it's kind of like the hipster web design. It was like, hey, it's like old school web. Yeah. Welcome to hipster Facebook. <laughs> well, you know what they say, what's old is new again, man. Come on. Don't be a hater. Yeah. <laughs> well... Well, the thing is that Twitter has already got these services that have been making tweets longer anyway. Twit longer, for instance, is one of the things mm -hmm. that they actually put out. So, well, not they put out, but you know what I mean. It has been put yeah. and used on Facebook. So I think this is them noticing stuff like that and going, people are doing this anyway. We might as well do it in our actual program so that people aren't using third-party things because they're going to do it anyway. We might as well hand them the tool to do it. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of the way Blizzard does uh, World of Warcraft. <clears throat> you know, World of Warcraft, whenever it was created, they they created it from the ground up with the ability to to had uh, to add mods, modifications, things to the program that will do certain things that the base program would not do. And over time, those particular mods they got really really popular. Well, the next expansion. All of a sudden, voila, hey, now it's integrated into the game. So, you know, that's great for the, the gameplay and community because that's one less mod they have to deal with and some of the incompatibilities and issues that mods would cause. But at the same time, some of these mod developers were actually making money off of their mods. Uh -huh. Even though there's a terms of service issue in there where, they're, if I remember correctly, they're only allowed to make money a certain way. Like you can't you can't pay for the mod, but mm. you could donate to the mod developer and stuff like that. Well, you know, if you had a popular mod that out of the twelve million players that were playing the game was installed on five million of them, and two million of them was give gave you a buck, or was giving you a dollar a month or whatever, and then suddenly everything that your mod did was now integrated in the game, and Blizzard didn't turn around and and give you any kind of compensation. I mean, what what's done is done. So um, it's it's not a foreign concept to see companies that have very successful products like World of Warcraft, Twitter, Facebook, and all to find you know where the community has found a hole and created a service or a mod or whatever to fill that need, and then the company go, you know what, that's a great idea, and then do it themselves. So. Apple does it all the time. They call it Sherlocking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or theft. Um, anyway. <laughs> okay. All right. Anything else on Twitter? Or, or have we pretty much tweeted out everything on that one? I couldn't come I up. I think with, we have. I couldn't come up with a good <laughs> one on that one. I'm sorry. That one wasn't half bad. <laughs> okay. Um... One quick note that I want to uh, to talk about, something I saw come across Paul Therott's short takes today. Uh, Nadella uh, Satya, I guess that's how you say his first name anyway. He's the CEO. Satya. Is it Satya? Okay, Satya yep. Nadella. Tim Cook and other tech CEOs have been summoned to the White House for a terrorism meeting. <laughs> oh, I vaguely overheard this when I was ignoring the news as I went out the door. <laughs> yeah. Well, and this this is just a very short paragraph, and I'm going to read it real quickly. It's It just says that the, the leaders of several tech heavyweights, including Apple, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, and Twitter, have been summoned like recal recalcitrant 
school children, that's a hard word to get your tongue over, to a White Mm. House meeting about ISIL, the Islamic State terrorism. Mm. Quote, the White House sees Silicon Valley as an integral part of fighting the propaganda from ISIL and other groups, a White House official said. There needs to be a concerted effort to fight the ISIL propaganda. Inviting these companies was a great idea then because it, when it comes to propaganda, no one is better than Apple. Plus, I assume there will be a discussion <laughs> about some sort of technological solution to terrorism too, you know, while they're there. And of course, that's all from Paul Therott, So that's not- uh, Yeah, that's, that's why I laughed like I did. I was like, oh yeah, Paul, he'd get a slight into Apple while he was at it. Oh yeah, of course. Of course. His sardonic wit that he's useful for. Um, now, okay. Oh, I, might, I might be lighting a powder keg what I'm about to ask. Um, it, it, does anyone else get uncomfortable? I know that we're dealing with a terrorist organization. So they're bad guys let's let's go ahead and go with the phrase i couldn't come up with anything more intelligent than that am i am i the only one that worries just a teensy bit that if we start having these companies censor things perfectly fine and probably need to be censored in this case that we might then take those policies and start maybe turning them towards things that might need to have a chance to talk by any chance, or is it just me? Do I, do I need to go get the royal of roll of tin foil now while I'm <laughs> ahead? Well, Not you, at all. I mean, who's the censor? I mean, that's that's yeah. the the bottom line, and and one of the things that freedom of speech and freedom of the press with some reasonable safeguards in place, like you can't yell fire in a crowded uh, movie theater, mm. but. You know, those freedoms, I mean, if, as soon as you start restricting them, you have to be really careful because, you know, you may you may agree with it now. You may agree with it the next time. But then, you know, once they start trying to restrict your speech, you know, it'll be too late. Mm. Yeah, I, I agree with that. It, it's it's always a slippery slope whenever you you just crack the door just a little bit where you're saying, well, we're we're going to censor this um, for anti-terrorism reasons. Um, you know, to me, that's like making a concerted effort to try to go online and find every instance of a bomb-making diagram and pulling it down. Mm. Well, as bad as it is to actually have the ability to go online and pull down a diagram to learn how to build your own bomb, that does fall up under the first amendment. So I'm, I'm always leery of anybody doing anything like this, especially when it, it's brought up under the guise of national security, terrorism, because th- too many things, and I don't want to get too political, but too many things over the last 10, 15 years have been brought up under that. Oh, we got to do this because, well, we're trying to keep our nation safe or we got to do that. And, you know, when when do you stop so i'm i'm not for it and and i can't validate this but you know there's a and so i'll i'll just simply say it's a rumor but there's a rumor going around online now that twitter is actually going to start censoring any type of anti-muslim rhetoric and of course they're all the the rumors indicate because one of the higher ups at twitter is now a muslim I don't know if that's true or not. Like I said, take that with a grain of salt. Uh, I did not. Di- I didn't do a deep dive into it. Didn't really care to. It's just that type of thing really kind of raises the hair on the back of my neck whenever you start hearing about it, and uh, and, and I I just don't like it. Mm. So you're not alone. So you can you can keep the tin full in its proper place for right now. Bring it out later. Good. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Uh, what else you got? Okay. Um, let's see here. <clears throat> well, there is one I, one I definitely want to talk about. I've got other ones, but this, this one is an interesting, I think it could lead us down several roads. Um, this is a tech crunch article. No more ballparks. End quote. Oculus Palmer Lucky admits to screwing up Rift 
price point messaging. Um, so this is about the Oculus Rift. For anyone who doesn't know what the Oculus Rift is, it's a virtual reality headset that you put on your head, and then you can be in a virtual it's hard to explain VR sometimes. You can be in a virtual environment that you see around you. Uh, for Star Trek fans, think holodeck, but not as advanced. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, not quite. <laughs> which I wish we could just skedaddle to holodeck, but that's just me. Um, but when I don't, I don't know why everyone's so excited about it, though, because I've had my Nintendo Virtual Boy. <laughs> since the mid 90s and i play with that every weekend so i don't you know you you do have your headache medicine on tap right because that's you're gonna need it if you play with that every weekend <laughs> sorry yes so it, it's similar to, to that in concept correct yeah but obviously a lot more advanced um and it's made to where like you move your head to the right your vision of the environment that you're in moves to the right as well, well so it's, but it's it, 20 years later, hopefully it's it's advanced quite a bit. Oh, yeah, totally. Excellent. Um, but I'm going to read a little bit of the article. Uh, Yesterday, VR fans eager to get their hands on the consumer version of the long-awaited Oculus Rift headset learned what co-founder Palmer Lucky meant when he said the price would be in the, quote, ballpark of last year's $350 development kit. Um, the cost of that quote, ballpark, turned out to be $1 short of $600. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, what what everyone's ticked off about is they he said, it'll be in the ballpark of $350. Apparently, the ballpark of $350 for him is $600. Bucks. <laughs> so. Yeah. Somebody done screwed up. Oh, yeah, and, and he went on to... Uh, he went on to Reddit and apologized, which was interesting. It was a it was a very brave thing to do going on Reddit and <laughs> in that environment. Uh, but it was also kind of a good spot for his specific <laughs> area. The people that were probably going to pay attention to this anyway were going to be on Reddit anyway. So he did an AMA and asked me anything for anyone that doesn't know a person who is renowned in a specific field of expertise says, I'm this person, ask me anything. And literally you're allowed to ask them anything much to some hilarious results sometimes. <laughs> um, but um, he conceded he had screwed up on the messaging, explaining that he said, quote, that ballpark, he had been thinking about a all-in cost of the Rift, which requires a gaming PC to power it. Ergo, in his mind, five ninety nine was more in the ballpark of three fifty than it was in the ballpark of fifteen hundred. Quote: I handled the messaging poorly," admitted Lucky. Uh, "My answer was ill prepared, and mentally, I was contrasting three forty nine with fifteen thousand, not our in internal estimate that hovered close to five ninety nine." That is why I said it was roughly in the same ballpark. Later on, I tried to get across that the Rift would cost more money than many expected. In the past two weeks particularly, there are a lot of reasons we did not do a better job of prepping people who already have high-end GPUs, legal, financial, competitive, and otherwise. But to be perfectly honest, our biggest failing was assuming we had been clear enough about setting expectations. So this story has two different spokes to me. One, it's about the Kickstarter culture that we're in, because this originally started as a Kickstarter project, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Um, and then, okay, and then it carried on. Um, and then there's also everyone so excited about virtual reality uh, that they're a bit frothy about it, let's put it that way. So when you suddenly... <laughs> have your enthusiast being told ballpark of 350 and then it ends up being 600 bucks they go what the heck <laughs> you know yeah th th that's when they start getting salty about it so uh, two different things for you guys i suppose one are you even curious about virtual reality because i have an opinion but i want to hold it back until you guys say something and then what do you think about this well this situation and the whole kickstarter culture as a general rule i suppose um well for me 
I, I I think virtual reality is pretty cool. I've I've had the the benefit of being able to play around with a friend of mine. He had uh what? The uh <laughs> ha, ha, Ignore ha. it. You're doing yeah. fine. Just You're doing fine. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna <laughs> ignore him. No, he had the, the Google cardboard, which is mm. like the cheapest form of VR that you can get. Uh it mm. because it is cardboard and two lenses. And you take your phone and you put it in there. And, of course, you install the apps. And uh, it it was very impressive. So, um, and very disorienting, too. And it's definitely come a long way. But, and what, to clarify, I was playing around with a friend's Google Cardboard. That's what I was trying to get out, okay? <laughs> Stop lighting up the chat about it, all right? <laughs> but um, I will not be spending $600 for virtual reality. Matter of fact, whenever I saw the price point, I actually tweeted out that it, you know, at $600, it's never going to go mainstream. It's not going to go mainstream until it's at least around 100 And, uh, of course, my son Devin said that, and he retweeted a tweet that says, you know, for the people that are upset for the cost of VR at $600, apparently you don't understand the cost of real life, which, <laughs> you know, was, was kind of, was, was kind of, you know, tongue in cheek, if you will. But right. um, I like it. I think it's a cool concept. Uh, it was definitely off the table for me at 1500. It's still off the table for me at 600. And mm. until it gets down to the price point where it's more like a commodity, I mean, granted, you know, I was having this this discussion, like I said, with Devin, and he said, well, look at gaming consoles. I mean, gaming consoles are still 300 to 500 dollars. I mean, the PS3, when it first came out, my God, was what, 700, something like that? It, it was, mm -hmm. it, I mean, people were, were outraged. But these things, just like uh, with external hard drives, I mean, think about the very first DVD burners. Good grief. Mm -hmm. Pricey, pricey, pricey. Now you can get them for 25 or 30 bucks. So at some point in the future, I do believe that virtual reality is going to come down to where it's, it's a consumer-friendly everyman purchase, $50 to $100, something like that. But until then, I'm just going to sit on the sidelines and, you know, and just, you know, with a little bag of popcorn and, and see what happens. Uh, you know, he made a mistake. Um, <laughs> I don't understand how he can do a comparison of the, well, the 350 is in the $600 ballpark like 600 is in the $1,500 ballpark. I mean, I don't understand that. That makes absolutely no sense to me whatsoever. But, I mean, those that's that's a huge gap. And, you know, you got to think about the fact that, I mean, th this, this, this is a world where we have been indoctrinated in the fact that 1995 is a deal, but $20 is too much. <laughs> true, so, true. But that, I mean, that's my feelings on it. I mean, Oliver, what do you think about VR? Well, I'm definitely interested from a, a just a technology perspective. However, I'm not going to be an early adopter mm. when it comes to VR. There's been way too many false starts, and I joked about that virtual reality Nintendo uh, device. But there's so many false starts where it just didn't work well, and it just wasn't a good purchase. So. I'm going to definitely, you know, keep an eye on it, see how how it evolves. And so the the 349 to 599, uh so he undershot it by, you know, it basically the 599 is 71 almost 72% more than the 349. So not double, but a significant amount more than the 350 that he kind of originally thought. Sounds like he just, you know, misspoke, underestimated how much it would cost and you know, lesson learned. You have to under promise, over deliver, and and this time, you know, he he did the opposite. Yeah, one of the things that I saw was um, because Philip DeFranco covered this on one of his episodes this week, and the guy came out and was talking about, well, you're not just getting the VR, you're you're getting the headgear, you're getting a, a Microsoft controller, you're getting some software. Uh -huh. It's actually a a, a bundle. And 
something about the fact that they have to they've got to deal with Microsoft where they have to bundle this stuff. Otherwise, they wouldn't even be able to afford to push the thing out at six hundred dollars, much less three hundred and fifty. So, you know, we we look at this, we see the internet lit up. Everybody got pissed off about the fact that it was priced at six hundred dollars. But you know what the bottom line is? The pre orders sold out. Mm. It, if you tried to order one now, it won't get shipped to you until June. And interesting customer note, anyone that did order one of the developer kits is being sent a normal one as well. Yeah. So anyone that got the developer kit is getting the full-fledged one as well. So, Which I think is cool because that's, that's something that you don't typically see. You know, you if you were one, like you say, and, and we're talking the people who backed you on or backed them on Kickstarter for the mm -hmm. development kit. If you were a Kickstarter backer for that kit, then you get this thing free. And, yep. you know, I, I think that is that is a very positive move to do that. Um, because to me, it would have been, I mean, if I'd have spent the money and I backed your Kickstarter project and then you're like, oh, well, now we have our very first official product, whatever, it's $600. Well, I don't know what the point, the price point was on Kickstarter to get the original that you had to like give to be able to get it, but I'm pretty sure it was over 600 Maybe. I don't know. But I know I'd be a little ill if I'd already spent that money. And then you're like, well, here's the product. And I'm like, dude, what happened? I mean, I know you got bought out by Facebook for $2 billion, but come on. <laughs> so, but I, I think they're doing a very good thing by doing that. Mm. So, so in my mind, virtual reality is something that is interesting to me. As someone that wears glasses, I'm always also worried about the extra layer of can I still wear those while I'm doing this because otherwise I'm blind as a bat and can't even do anything. Um, <laughs> but but on top of that, really, um, it is an interesting thing. I, You know me. I, I dream big. I'm the one that tosses confetti in the air and goes, here's the awesome stuff that we're going to be able to do. You know, <laughs> futurist would be a phrase you could use to describe me in certain situations. So as someone that sometimes hangs around in virtual environments and stuff like that online, I would love to have a virtual reality helmet where you could just put it on. And I have contacts across the pond, as it were, the people that aren't in this country, across the border and across the pond, both instances. I would love to have a virtual reality set up where I could put my VR headset down, and then it's like we're all having a conversation in the same room. I mean, imagine imagine this call we're doing right now. You and Oliver are both in Georgia, and I'm in Kentucky. Wouldn't it be awesome if we flipped a headset down, and then I saw you guys virtually in my studio in the two chair positions like we're having a conversation in the same room? Oh, yeah. That'd be awesome. So, so yes, when we want it, how <laughs> often... How often would we want it? And, and I say that because right now, all three of us have the capability to do video stream. Mm. But yet, here we are doing audio only, which yeah. I appreciate that from a, a bandwidth perspective because I have weak internet. But mm. I just have noticed so many times I've invested at work, we've invested a lot in video conferencing infrastructure. And... So many people turn off the cameras on their phone because <laughs> they're self-conscious yeah. about how they look. And so I absolutely agree where, you know, in certain environments where that would help communication, being able to actually see the, the 3D, you know, virtual reality of, of that kind of conversation would be great. I just don't think a lot of people would use it. Just like today, well, we don't use video conferencing as much as we could. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and that's making the assumption that we just project our real selves. I'm even going farther down the rabbit hole of their, their environments like Second Life and things like that. A friend recently got me into that. No, no one's going to know who I am on there because I like some anonymity from time to time. Um, but you built on that thing, you build. <laughs> uh, thank you. For wow, that the research. early 2000s calling, dude. 
I just got cable. Get off my back. Um, <laughs> so everything is the early 2000s calling me at this point. Um, but yeah, the, there's a whole culture of people that do. They build virtual avatars. Some people playing even different characters that aren't even close to them. You know, uh, but there's other things like there's a DJ culture on there you wouldn't believe. People actually do DJ things and make money doing it. It's it's insane the stuff that goes on on there that I had no idea happens. Oh, there's but a hel- ima- there's a hellacious real estate market in there. Yeah, I know. Uh, it's it's insane. Their own currency and everything. You you go down the rabbit hole, you go down deep when you're looking into that stuff. Uh, but it, it's. I can see environments like Second Life and stuff being turned into virtual reality and being a really big thing because there's already people on there that also chat using voice. So it would not be that far of a stretch to take these fully rendered 3D environments and move them to the virtual reality space. That's, I guess that's the sort of thing I've kind of got Mm -hmm. in my head when it comes to that sort of thing. And I think that would be popular for the same crowd that plays Second Life now, which, I mean, is, is a large number, for, I'm sure, but mm. it's not like the general application. Right. I, I, I struggle with that, given my experience with video. Mm. I think virtual reality is where it's really going to find its niche is in training. Um, for instance, being able to train and this is kind of getting in your backyard, Oliver, but training surgeons on proper surgical techniques and things like that. Um, And I know that, I I say I know, I've heard or read uh, that they already do some some things similar to that or maybe not that advanced. But, I mean, I could imagine where, you know, using virtual reality, you actually have a very realistic human body laying on a table, and this is how you practice on the proper surgical technique of, you know, whatever, uh, open heart surgery or, I don't you know, removing a spleen. I mean, things like that. So I, I think that's where virtual reality is really going to shine is in, in the niche markets. I don't think, even though, like I said, for it to be accessible for the everyman, it's got to be in the $50 to $100 range. But even with that said... I don't really know, other than just playing games, uh, you know, how many... I mean, I have an Xbox 360 that has a Kinect. You know, the Kinect, that's not virtual reality per se, but it's kind of connected to it in a way because it can, you know, it can scan me. It knows where I am in the room. It knows whenever I wave my hand and all this kind of stuff. And uh, I played some games using the Kinect. That lasted all of about two months, and I haven't played an Xbox 360 and especially a Kinect game in probably four years. Right. I remember that mom, bless her, she got me a Kinect one year, not really understanding that you had to have a large amount of space in order to use it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It does not work in a camper. Let's put it that way. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I imagine not. Mm. I mean, Oliver's seen my living room, and I still had to move uh, the couches back and things like that to make it work uh, correctly. And I was playing, the game I was playing at the time, I'm trying to remember it. Uh, Did you dance? No, I I played Fruit Ninja. (laughs) I loved Fruit Ninja. Because you stood there and actually, you know, did like karate chop moves. Mm. Um, Let me tell you, you want a workout? Do that for 30 mm. minutes. I almost couldn't move the next day. <laughs> but, it, yeah, I, I, I guess the point is, is, yeah, sometimes technology, we look at it and we can say, this is cool, but then whenever you look at it in the real-world application, is it really going to fly? Just like what Oliver's talking about with video conferencing. You know, you can, it's a great idea. Let's, you know, let's, Save on travel. I mean, that's the original things. The original idea for video conferencing was let's save on travels. We don't have to actually fly in all 
go to one location and meet, we're all going to do video conferencing. And Go to my PC ad still strive on that very specific point. So that, they're still yep. pushing it to this day. And I know that there are companies out there that do take advantage of it, but it's, it's kind of like the notion is oversold versus how it's actually used or how often it's actually used. So, um... Yeah. Did I say go to my PC? I meant go to meeting. Anyway. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah. Go go to meeting. Don't go to my PC. That stuff's a rip off. <laughs> well, but, but so to your point, Donovan, just today I got an email at work for uh we have residents, uh you know, physician mm-hmm. residents at our facility and one of the schools actually contacted me to set up some video conferencing so they could have their residents who are on site at our location. Uh, call in and and actually converse with peers at other locations, you know, throughout the Southeast. So that'll be kind of interesting to see how they make use of that. And of course, since it's healthcare, we have to be very uh, cautious and careful with any sort of, you know, patient information. So we're going to have some conversations in the next couple of weeks to kind of talk about how that's all going to work and, and make sure it's all secure. But I mean, that's a great example of really assisting in education of, you know, our physicians of tomorrow. Mm. Yeah. And I think that's great. Uh, my, my first experience with any kind of video conferencing like that was not long after I started working for the city of Tifton. And of course, as I've said before, the city of Thomasville actually put together the original uh, cable modem termination system package. And they actually, uh, paid to get the first two T1 connections up to us because they were doing the same thing. And the city kind of caught itself with its pants around its ankles at the last minute and had to uh, basically look for alternatives, and that's how they arrived with Thomasville. But when I was down there visiting with them, they they actually had a huge, like a at the time, and I mean, this was 2000, 1999, 2000, somewhere in there when I, I saw this. They had like a 36-inch TV camera. You know, the the IT manager was like, yeah, this is our video conferencing setup so that businesses can come in and use it, and we can video conference with our other three cities that we supply broadband to and all this other kind of stuff. Um, but I never heard much more about it after that. So I think they're great. I think all of this is great. It's just it's it's specific niches of where it actually works the best. And, uh, you know, if you go back to the 40s and 50s, you would expect that every one of us would be walking around and every time we received a phone call, it'd be a video call. Yeah, we have that capability. I can call every one of you, well, with the exception of Sam right now, but, you know, all of us that have smartphones can do video calling. (laughs) I can still do video calling with my iPod. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. So, I mean, either via Skype or, you know, now, like with Verizon, uh, on the newer phones, it supports uh, uh, Volte and actually, you know, HD calling, video calling. You don't even have to have another app to do it as long mm. as it's a Verizon to Verizon. So it's it's an exciting time to be alive for sure, but... You know, sometimes you just have to wonder about about the technology is like you get all this fanfare and then it's like, yeah, I mean, honestly, when I saw Facebook bought Oculus Rift for two billion dollars, I wanted to find out exactly what Zuckerberg was smoking, because apparently it was some (laughs) damn good stuff and I needed it. So. Well, it's funny. Uh, Patrick Norton managed to make the Daily Tech News show have a moment of silence whenever he <laughs> presented his theory on it. He said, virtual makeouts. And apparently he said this during a family dinner, which immediately made everyone around the table go as silent as the co-host on the episode did whenever he said that. He said, no, teenagers are just going to have virtual makeouts, and that's all they're going to do on Facebook with this virtual technology. You know, <laughs> So clearly the voice of a parent, even though he doesn't have a daughter, he has a son, but still clearly the voice of a parent. <laughs> hey, he's not, he's not far off. I actually uh, caught part of an episode of Kind of Funny Games. They stream on uh, Twitch daily. And they were covering a story, and I forget the name of the company, but it's it's a porn company. 
And, of course. <laughs> and this was something I believe that was actually being, it was, I think it was being demonstrated at CES because the guys were talking about it and it was like, okay, you know, we've, we've demoed a, thousands and thousands and thousands of things. How odd is it that you would sit down, put on a, a pair of VR goggles, and be exposed to pornography, as in, and they explain in the article, the guy said, I put the glasses on, I sit down, and, you know, suddenly, and, and you've got a 180-degree view. You know, there's this woman that comes in, and he said, then I look down, and I see, you know, I see the, this muscular body, but it's not mine. But after a while, my brain starts making me think that it's mine. And then another girl comes in, and basically they start performing sex acts on him. And he's like, the brain, you actually feel like you're in there and doing this. And I thought that was so funny because the the guys on Kind of Funny were talking about the fact that, about the demo, it's like, how do you handle something like that when you're, you're there and you're surrounded by, you know, the people that work at the company and all, and you're sitting there and... You're basically participating in in your own personal porno movie. <laughs> and I'm like, that industry right there is what's going to make VR take off. <laughs> because you know every new technology that comes about, if, if, porn, if the porn industry can take advantage of it, that's where it's going to excel. <laughs> yeah, but like for the multiple camera angles and DVDs, do you remember that? Yeah, <laughs> vaguely, and I think that's probably the point. Right. Well, I mean, so I I, re I recall you know hearing that porn was using that technology, but that kind of died, or maybe they still use it, but that has never really taken off. So they they don't always pick the they're not always uh, trendsetters. Not always. Mm. That's true. But yeah, I mean, I think. Uh, Anytime you have a new technology like that, uh, yeah, I mean, porn will will find a way to get in there. Now, my question is, let's say you're you're married. This is more <laughs> of a philosophical question. Oh and, dear! <laughs> and you make up you you get in this virtual reality world like Second Life, and you make out with somebody else. Is that cheating? <laughs> I can Go. tell I can tell you what my. Uh... I, what my wife would say. Well, what would you say? I would have to say, yeah. Okay. I would have to say, yeah. Now, if you'd asked me that question 20 years ago, I, I would have said, are you kidding? I didn't touch her, you know, but no. Um, being the older, wiser, more seasoned <clears throat> guy that I am now, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I would I would have to say that even if it's just barely skirting the ideology of cheating, it, it should still be considered cheating. Yeah, even in even in the world of people playing characters, which I guess full disclosure, I play a character. That's one of the reasons why no one's going to know who the heck I am. Um, there, I I have privacy in certain things. Let's put it that way. Uh, no, but. But it, yeah, I know me. It, 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 we finally found the one thing that I act private about. Who knew? Who would have thunk it? Um, but no, it's there. There is a complete subculture on, and I'm going to go for Second Life again of people playing characters. You know, it's it's role playing. It's playing a different person. You know, but even then, I think that if you were in a relationship, I would still count it as cheating even if you are playing a character, right? I would, I would never be comfortable doing anything like that, um, playing a character or otherwise. You know, I mean, it's, there, there's always the argument for people that are actors that sometimes have to kiss another person even though they're married. But I tend to think that that's more of a professional thing than being on Second Life and having some fling time, okay? Because <laughs> like the nicest way to put it i already but, i already yeah. know what sam's uh username is on on the second life you want to know what it is what funky bunky boom boom dang it now i've got to change my name <laughs> Shoot. but sam to your point about uh 
<laughs> actors uh, like kissing when they're married. Mm. And, but that's not like secretive, I would hope, and not and you know the the partner who could be cheated on would be you know okay or at least provides consent, etc. So I mean that mm. that's the part is just because somebody kisses another person uh, and they have a spouse that that doesn't automatically mean it's cheating. Yeah, there are, there are also certain couples who would be like, no, do what you want too. So that's exactly. that's a thing. So, <laughs> but, all right, sorry for that tangent, but I was just. Well, you know, that's one of those interesting things that'll kind of come up when you do this virtual reality because it will be more real than text on a screen or what have you that we're kind of dealing with now. Well, you know, this isn't virtual reality, but it's, it's, uh, I kind of want to do a tangent off of this a little bit, but, um, because it had, it, it deals with video, but, um, all of us have seen the Guardians of the Galaxy, the first movie, right? Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. So, you know, they're making a, Gu- a Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. I mean, uh, <laughs> th- that was a no-brainer. So Yeah, big duh. <laughs> yeah. So, it was announced that they were going, this will be the very first movie to shoot on what's called uh, Red's new Weapon 8K camera. And of course, you know, 8K refers to the 8K resolution in digital video, which is 8,000 pixels. And I mean, we've had 2K video, 4K video, uh, 8K televisions, I think, were actually on display at CES uh, last year. And I think they are this year, too, if I'm not mistaken. Probably. So, of course, what that that, that results in a higher resolved detail and... It's just going to give a, a higher quality picture. Now, in the past, um, let's see, you know, Captain America Civil War had key scenes shot in IMAX. Uh, Avengers Infinity War movies, both of them, are going to be shot entirely in IMAX. So this is going to be the first one to be shot in 8K. And to my knowledge, and it doesn't actually state here in the um, in the article, I don't believe there are any theaters out there that currently project 8K. It's typically 4K. But even shooting in 8K, you're going to wind up with a sharper image when it's projected in 4K. Mm. So it's um I've only seen one IMAX movie and it was actually at it was it, it was at some theme park or something. And and it was uh it was awesome. I mean it was it was definitely awesome. So I know that this pro- really doesn't mean a whole lot to m- most people because personally, number one, I don't go to the movie theater. I mean I haven't yeah. seen Star Wars: uh, The Force Awakens. I'm not going to see it until it comes out on VOD. So whether this thing is shot in 8K, 4K, or 8 bit doesn't matter to me as long as I can tell what's going on, because I'm going to watch it on a 720p, 32-inch television at my house. Yeah, for people like you, it doesn't make any sense. Now, I actually do go to the movie theater from time to time, although it's usually a thing our family does, hence why anytime we do a review over on our network, it's the three of us in the room talking. (laughs) Our Star Wars review might be one of the most interesting reviews we've ever done based on different tangents that different of us went to. But if you've seen the movie, we might offend you. (laughs) But but anyway, we liked it. Spoiler alert, we liked it, at least that. So you can't fault us on that one. Um, But there has always been this question, how detailed can the human eye actually see things? And as we keep on pushing these things, i that's my one question. At some point, where are we going to hit that kid off, cut off where no matter how awesome we make the image, how much perception are we really going to get out of this? I mean, that's what I always think anyway is, okay, you're bringing it to a higher resolution as my voice slowly goes. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> you're bringing it to a higher resolution. Mm-hmm. Will I be able to notice? You know, it's it's that sort of thing. For yeah, me. will you be able to see the the razor burn on Peter Quill's face? I yeah. mean, you know, that that's the big issue that started ha- happening in the porn industry whenever they started going to standard HD. I mean, 
And I don't know why we keep gravitating back to porn, but anyway. Um, <laughs> You're the one doing it, Donovan. I, yeah, yeah well, what's hey, this we stuff? <laughs> we we are a group. You know, what, what one of us does, the entire group does, right? Uh, anyway. <laughs> But no, seriously, that was always a, a a big issue whenever HD was becoming the thing, even in uh, the the porno industry, and uh, you know the the various blemishes and what have you that you would not notice previously. Suddenly, all of the actors and actresses had to be very self conscious of of you know certain things on their bodies because that camera was going to pick it up. Oh, you mean some form of entertainment made its actors feel shallow about themselves? So uh, who would have thunk it, really? I know, right, <laughs> honestly. I mean, geez. But, yeah, ultimately, like, I haven't, I don't think I've ever seen a 4K screen in action. So I haven't seen one that's not playing 4K content. I haven't seen one that is. But you didn't buy that iMac? With- well, it's at Retina, so it's not. No, I'm talking about 4K. I'm talking about the 5K. Yeah, yeah. So I have the Retina iMac, so that's 5K, but yeah. I don't have any content. Okay. And it's a beautiful screen. But what I would say is I have a Thunderbolt display right next to it, and I can tell a difference if I'm really looking at the smoothness and the the color. But if I'm just back actually doing work and you know doing the kind of the boring stuff that's work. Uh, I can't really tell a difference. And what I mean boring stuff is like email and and corresponding and looking at applications and those types of things. I haven't really seen a huge difference there. Uh, but the cons- it's all consumer driven, right? So mm-hmm. I think I think you'll have some humans just like you have super tasters. I'm sure you have people who can see a heck of a lot better uh, than others and can, you know, did, I guess identify some of those finer details. And at some point, you, you'll probably just get to the point where a small subset will will do that, but a lot of people will still buy it because I mean it's not that much more expensive. Prices will continue go to go down, but you know at some point, I think it'll just hit a p- point where it's not the 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 additional progress isn't worth the the R and D. Similar to CDs or MP3s now, or however we get our music, mm-hmm. that really hasn't fundamentally changed in a while as far as audio quality. I mean, sure, the the, the method and the delivery model has changed, but you know, we're still downloading a lot of the times MP3s, oh, and yeah. we have had some people trying to um, change that, right? And it's there have been several high quality players and stuff like that um shoot. but most people don't care yeah they don't in fact i'm even trying to f- remember what the big time musician that was behind one of these was and of course it's completely skipping my brain that that tells you how freaking important it was and i'm an audio guy you know so it's that that shows you something whenever someone that even cares can't remember <laughs> so <laughs> Yeah, so I think the TV will go the same way, but yeah, from what I've heard from people who enjoy 4K, it's pretty impressive. Yeah, see, I'm in a family where I'm really the only one, maybe Tyler. Uh, of course, I can't count Devin because he's not, he, he's only here, you know, 13 days out of the uh, out of the year. But yeah. um, the rest of the family, they don't really care about HD. I mean, the number of times that I walk into my living room and instead of it being on the sci-fi channel, on the HD channel, it's actually on the SD channel. And I'm like, this is an HD TV. Why are you not on the HD channel? Oh, well, I know the channel number and, you know, I don't really see a difference. Hmm. And and that hurts my brain because you're... <laughs> There, there is a substantial difference. I mean, even though the SD is a digital signal because this cable system is now all digital, there is still a difference. It's an SD versus HD. Um, it's a 4.3 SD versus a 16.9 HD. And, and, but I'm the only one that really, really cares about it being on the HD channel. I have a 36-inch JVC tube type television in my bedroom not an hd but i still put it on the hd channels because you know the boxes will down convert Mm. because to me 
it's actually a, still a slightly better uh, quality picture. Mm. And our producer found it, by the way. It is Neil Young that tried to create a high-quality audio player. Um, the uh, Pono. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, I, I had never the... heard of that. Yeah, I've never I... heard of it. <laughs> Yeah, again, audio file circles and stuff like that. That's the only reason why I knew. And it was it was one of those eye rolling things where the Pono will have its own store where you can get lossless files from that aren't MP3. It's like, wow, you mean you're gonna have to invest in an entire infrastructure just for no, no one's gonna do that. And I, and as far as I know, it it didn't really take off that much. I mean, I'm sure some people bought them, but yeah. Well, it's it's very difficult to compete with the juggernaut known as Apple. I mean, mm. you you get a 320 kilobit file from them now and they're talking about going lossless. Mm. Because you know, in the early days when they first came out with with the uh iTunes store and all of that for music, you still had bandwidth constraints. Mm. And they they slowly, I think they went from 256 uh and uh, jump, what did I say? Three, my brain, I just, is it three? Yes, yeah, 320. They went from 256 to 320 and then potentially going lossless. And mm. of course, there's there's flack and all these other things out there. And But it, it really comes down to, I mean, the number of online streams, audio streams, that are streaming out at 64K MP3 just blows my mind. <laughs> because some are talk only and some are music. You mm. take that same stream and you pump it out at 64K AAC, you will hear a tremendous difference. Mm. Tremendous difference. Uh, it's, it's more the equivalent. It's, it's better than 128K MP3 mm. because actually 48K AAC is the equivalent of about 128K MP3. So, you know, AAC is the superior codec, but yet what is the dominant codec that's used for music online? MP3. MP3. <laughs> so. Okay. Uh, Sam, you got another one you want to talk about or... I know we were headed for an hour, right? I think we well, might keep getting close to that. We're getting close to it. Um, I've only got, out of this bundle, I've got maybe one or two that I want to cover real quick. And okay. we can we can actually hold off on some of these until next week if we want to. Mm -hmm. um, I guess this one will be really quick, um, <laughs> potentially. I mean, we get deep into topics here. I've, I'm loving this, by the way, being to, getting to be a tech pundit again. Um Toyota Q and, and QNX partner with Ford to challenge Android Auto and Apple CarPlay. Now, what this means is that the infrastructure that is, um, well, I'll just let Tim Stevens tell us. It's beginning to become a bit of a foregone conclusion in the minds of many of of many that the dashboard, one of the most important aspects of a car, will soon be controlled not by the vehicle manufacturer but by the driver's smartphone. However, automakers aren't keen to give up that valuable real estate without a fight. Ford, in particular, has been developing its own platform, Smart Device Link, as an industry standard for, for, for smartphone connectivity. That standard just got a major boost with the announcement that both Toyota and BlackBerry-owned QNX are adding support. Um, so Apple already has CarPlay. Google has Android Auto. And now these... Car makers are starting to get together with their own thing to kind of try to push it out a little bit. I mean, the example, the big example is that Pandora will pretty much uh, be supported in anything. I think Pandora works on any of these systems um, as an app. Mm -hmm. but, but more people are wanting these apps to work with their car instinctively without them having to do anything other than Bluetooth it. And there we go. Not even have to have an aux jack, right? Um, so it's an interesting little chunk of this that the car makers are starting to notice, holy crap, Apple and Google are going to eat our lunch on something that's a big part of our, of our car that we create if we don't do something. And so this is them trying to do something about it. 
as the way I'm seeing it. So, so while some people are going, oh, they're going open source with this and go, because it is, it's open source, um, but they're going open source with this and everything. There, there's business behind this. Let's, let's oh, yeah. not, let's not forget that little aspect of it. Yeah. I just, I don't know how I feel about any of this. You know, I have, I have a 2013 Ford Focus that is, if I recall correctly, the last year that Ford produced vehicles that had the Microsoft sync in it. Mm. And it is a tremendous letdown. Um, the, the most that I do is I get in my car and it automatically connects to my phone via Bluetooth for telephone calls. If I want to use the phone to play audio, I have to specifically select that device as the audio device, so then I can stream from, you know, a, a podcast app or whatever. Uh, I've had times where, I mean, I'm supposed to be able to talk to it, so I can, I've got like a flipper control on the, on my steering wheel, and I can flip mm. it, and I'm, I, and I, I can say <clears throat> Bluetooth audio, and the voice will come up and say Bluetooth audio, and then it'll connect to my phone, and now I can play stuff. It, it has about a 50% failure rate where it won't recognize my voice. And it, it started doing that after I had the vehicle probably a year and a half. So I don't even mess with that anymore. I just reach up, hit a couple of buttons, you know, go through the menu and select it that way. It's supposed to have these apps or it's supposed to be able to connect you know, it's, it's supposed to be Spotify aware and all this. I can't use any of that crap. None of it is intuitive. You know, I want to get in my car and basically either hit a button or just say, you know, hey, car or whatever, play so and so or stream so and so. And, and we're not there yet. And, mm -hmm. and honestly, it, it is a safety thing. I mean, I, I think it's a great idea to have this type of technology so that you're not fiddling with your damn phone while you're going down the road, but you can actually talk to it. You can tell it to navigate through certain menu structures, play certain content. I think that's fantastic. But the system that I personally have been exposed to, which is the Microsoft Sync, is horrendous. And <laughs> if every other system is even close to that, then I have no use for them. Interesting. See, I, d I don't have any experience with any of these systems myself, so um, I've been going straight off of other people's experience, like yours. So, Yeah, I don't really have much experience because I drive a 2010 Toyota Yaris, and basically my high-end in integration with my phone is through an aux cable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Same here. <laughs> Before, and so, before mine died, but anyway. So I, I'm, I'm pretty, I'll be impressed with, you know, pretty much anything. But my wife's car has a Bluetooth integration. You know, it's easy enough to, to play music and stuff. But, I, you know, I guess there's a lot of stuff like this that people get really excited about and are really eager to, to move to the next generation of solution. And to me, at the end of the day, it's me in a car driving somewhere playing audio. Mm. Yeah, that's and, it. And 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 ultimately, like I, my my redneck solution now <laughs> through the through the aux cable, you know, it works. Like I have no problems looking at my phone and selecting. Yeah, hey, yes, I want to play this playlist or I want to play this podcast as I'm driving into work and setting it down and going on my way. I don't. I'm pretty it's simple so that way. It's simple time management. If you know you're going to take 30 minutes to get somewhere, play a podcast that's 30 minutes, and you do not have to dangerously touch your stereo at all. I mean, it's just time management. <laughs> oh, yeah. When I was driving back and forth uh, between here and Fitzgerald, you know, that uh, it, it worked out because even if I was listening to podcasts that were, say, an hour, hour and a half, so, you know, three trips – you know, one there, one back, and another one there, and I I had a ninety minute podcast done, mm. and because I, I have I have no problem stopping in the middle of one or what have you, and then and picking it back up. So, you know, that's primarily the the big benefit that I got out of the whole Microsoft Sync 
was simply the Bluetooth integration. That was it. There's nothing mm-hmm. else in that that Microsoft Sync that uh, that really does anything for me. Yeah, big deal. I can I can receive phone calls and talk hands free, or I can press the button and I can tell it call mom and it'll you know it'll dial her and stuff like that. But beyond that, it's it's mainly just listening to audio. So it'll be interesting to see where these these companies go. I I had a feeling. I mean, you know, these companies do these deals with like uh, certain brands will do deals with Apple. Another brand will do deals with Google. But you got to stop and wonder if they didn't stop and go, wait a minute, we we need to do our own thing here. I mean, why why are we why are we paying them? Yep, kind of thing. So, all right, we are coming up or have gone over an hour. So I want to cover one more story, if that's okay with you guys, and then we'll we'll wrap it up. Okay. Um, this one is dealing with, um, SHA-1, which is, uh, SHA-1 certificates. Now, just a a quick background on that. You know, whenever you go to to a website and you, you get the little lock up in the, in the uh, web address bar, and you'll notice that it doesn't say HTTP, it says HTTPS. Mm. And so what that is, is that's an SSL certificate. And uh, for the longest time, all of the websites have been supporting an SHA-1 certificate. There has been a push over the last probably year, if not longer, to move away from SHA-1 and go to SHA-2. And that's because SHA-1 is on the verge of being cracked. And Mm. so if it gets, if it's cracked, then the algorithm is useless. And so you can't. You can't trust any secure site that you go to. So in an effort to try to, to push that, your, your browser makers, uh, Mozilla, Google, Microsoft, are getting to the point where they're going to disable SHA-1 capability in the browser, meaning that if you go to a website that is still using an SHA-1 certificate, you can't access that site. Was this the thing that Google did where they did it like a year early on the search thing in order to try to almost blackmail people to upgrade ahead of time or something like that? Uh, I can't say for certain if that was connected to this or not, but what this particular article is dealing with is Firefox jumped the gun and <laughs> went ahead and banned SHA-1 in theirs. And um, let's see, it says, In a blog post, security engineer Richard Barnes explained that most Firefox users aren't affected, and those who can simply upgrade to the latest version of Firefox, version 43.0.4, released on Wednesday, will fix the problem. Um, what it was is they had... Um, they had blocked it. They said they temporarily reinstated support for the vulnerable cryptographic algorithm after some Firefox users were unable to access encrypted HTTPS websites. So and I'm presuming that they must have blocked it in like version 42 or 43.03 or something like that. They don't really say. But if you find that you're going to websites and for whatever reason you can't connect, then and you're using Firefox, then you need to check your version, and you probably should upgrade to 43.0.4, and, um, and and that'll solve the problem. But keep in mind that at some point in the future, they're going to do it again because websites, and particularly Chinese websites, are going to be the ones that are most affected. They just don't seem to give a crap. Um. Facebook Chief Security Officer Alex Stamos actually said in a December blog post that while the social network supports the deprecation of SHA-1 certificates, the company does not think it's right to cut tens of millions of people off from the benefits of the encrypted Internet. Cloudflare, uh, Cloudflare excuse me, Chief Executive Matthew Prince, who said that the move would leave a whole chunk of the Internet in the past, said as many as 37 million users would face problems with China being the most affected. Mm. So it's just something to keep in mind. 
I haven't run into the problem because I I don't use Firefox. I still use Chrome. I use Firefox for testing, but mm. um, Firefox uh, Mozilla is still committed to banishing the support for SHA one down the line. So, um, let's see. Mozilla didn't say when exactly it would again drop support, but Barnes suggested that SHA one support could be dropped in the coming weeks or months in Firefox forty five. Or 46. So, um, Oliver, in your networking environment, do y'all have to, do y'all have secure sites that y'all have to deal with? I mean, is this going to be an issue for y'all or what do you think? Uh, partially. Um, you know, we have obviously secure certificates for anything that, you know, should require it facing the external world. Internally, we have some certificates, but, but, but mostly those are self-signed with yeah. our own CA. So we're not too worried about it there. But uh, obviously, we're, we're looking to make sure all of our certificates are SA, SHA2, but it's not really a priority. And, and the reason is, you know, it's great when you are sitting at a computer and you're into this type of stuff and you're like, you know what? SHA1 is bad. SHA2 is good. I don't see why everyone who cares about this stuff just doesn't upgrade. Well, you know, companies and all these other organizations have so many other competing priorities that really they're focusing their resources on. And, you know, when, when you look at SHA-1, this may be short-sighted, but it's not, it's not compromised yet. And it won't be until probably practically 2018 based on kind of what Bruce Schneier has, has kind of said from uh, some of his discussions. So it's not like it's eminent, or I guess I shouldn't say that. I guess it's not right now the problem, but it will be in the short future. But again, this is way better. So having an SHA-1 site today is way better than basically breaking SSL and saying it's not working. I agree. So it's, it's, it's tough because, you know, I know all these security minded folks when, and, and I'm one of those is, you know, Hey, let's get it, let's move on and, and let's make sure our stuff is protected. But there are thousands of websites out there and that's just not something that's a priority for most people. Yeah, I, I agree. It, it's one of those issues where we know what we should do, but it, it just doesn't make sense at this, at, at this point. And I, I kind of liken it, and this is kind of a stretch, and and here again, it's going to sound a little bit political, but I kind of liken it to whenever Obama first got into office and he was talking about how he was basically going to force us to get off of fossil fuels by bankrupting the oil industry. And I'm like, you know, I, I like the direction that you're heading. Yes, we should strive to get to alternative energies and, and get off of fossil fuels, but I don't think tanking the economy is the right way of doing it. And that's kind of the same thing here. It's like, yeah, everybody needs to to move away from SHA-1, but I don't think that cutting off access to, you know, 37 million websites or whatever is the right way to go about it, you know. So, um, Sam, what do you think about it? You got any any comment on that? This this is where it's more you guys' field of expertise, right? I'm always the one that you can run to to go, what does the everyman think of this? Because I'm a bit blah, 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 when it comes to this sort of thing. <laughs> There's a reason I used to listen to a security podcast before I moved away from listening to a certain network altogether. Um, but I what? don't know. It It seems to me that with a lot of security things, and this is my outsider's view of it, right, that the main thing that happens is everyone overreacts way too quickly. And this, this seems to be one of those for me. Okay. Yeah. Cause I mean, it, it does affect the every man. I mean, when you go, mm -hmm. when you access your online banking, I mean, you're using a, a, a secure certificate and I, I would feel better knowing that they're using an SHA two certificate over an SHA one, but Am I going to stop accessing my bank because they're not? No, not until right. such time as, like Oliver said, if it does get broken somewhere around 2018 and they still are using SHA-1, then I've got a concern because now 
I, I don't feel safe logging in and, and providing, you know, potential access to my financial information. But oh for- yeah, don't get me wrong. I I know it affects me, but it's it's one of those things where me knowing the nitty gritty of it. Oh yeah, my eyes kind of glaze over at some point. So well, it was yeah. it was your everyman commentary that I was after. Mm. <laughs> Just work. <laughs> I mean, and and you know, I think Google's approach seems to be a little more, or it seems to be less heavy handed, and that's where. You know, they've started showing warnings in Chrome. Mm-hmm. And I don't know the current state of those. I don't know if it's just showing as red now and, and not doing that. But they actually have some uh, plans where if an if a certificate is issued after January 1st and it's using the, the SHA-1, I guess, signature, then it will reject it. So that's yeah. kind of smart because if it's if it's a brand new certificate, and you're using SHA-1, knock it off. Yeah. And so it's kind of, so it's it's definitely pushing people to do the right thing without just being so heavy-handed and breaking, you know, a large portion of sites. Mm. So I can appreciate that uh, approach a lot more than what Firefox tried to do. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah, I think the certificate I'm using on slant.fm is is appropriate. Um, it's well, a, they, let's look. <laughs> go there and look, yeah. I'm looking at it. It's uh, The connection is using TLS 1.2. It's encrypted and authenticated using AES 128 GCM and uses ECDHERSA as the key exchange mechanism. Because I'm pretty sure whenever I had to create the key, I had I created it's using shot two fifty six. Yeah. So, it's good. Mm. Yeah, because shot one was I think only one hundred and sixty bytes. Mm-hmm. So, and I set up a lot of VPNs back in the day, and that was when it was either triple des or no, no, I'm sorry, it was MD five or SHA one. Yep. For for the, I guess the signature. Uh huh. Oh, I remember and, that. We yeah, had a so. uh, we had sonic walls at the time. Bless our hearts. But um, and, <laughs> for the city. Yeah, so, <laughs> so yeah, I think I think your you know the slant FM certificate looks pretty good. But and that's the thing. Anything that's been issued in the last couple of years, hopefully it's it's using the right because there's no real reason not to. Yeah. So I think it'll be handled appropriately. And at some point, you know, I think once you have a a confirmed like problem with it, as opposed to theoretical, and this is maybe where I'm being a little naive, that's when you kind of really put the hammer down and say, clearly this has been proven. And now it's time to just say, let's, let's get this cleaned up. Mm. Yeah. I think ultimately we're, we're at that point where you, you need to, you need to raise the red flag and say, hey, this needs to change. But you don't brute force it and say, by Monday, January the 11th, we're no longer going to accept, you know, SHA-1. Yeah, you can't there's do that. A ti- there's a time to pull the trigger, but don't pull it too early. Yeah, because as evidenced by the uh, attempt at going to digital television, that thing got rescheduled, I think, like four times over a 10-year period. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, you know, you, you got to be able – I mean, there there's there are business practices and cases and, and, like Oliver said, priorities. And, I mean, all these things have to be taken into consideration. And, and uh, you know, it potentially can be broken. It hasn't been broken yet. As so, far as we're aware. As far as we're aware. That is correct. And, you know, and I'm, I'm kind of becoming cynical because I think one response, and a reasonable response would be, well, you know, with the whole problem with uh, the NSA and Snowden, Snowden mm-hmm. is, you know, our, our government may have already broken it. And then you have these instances in the recent uh, past where uh, – commercial firewall codes uh, i think it's the net screens had had been shown to actually have been hacked where they have a basically a hard-coded password to get into them 
And the one article I read on that a while back was, you know, was the NSA the one who who did this? Because mm-hmm. they actually infiltrated the source code, uh, you know, for running those net screens. So the firmware or the, you know, whatever the operating system is and added that. Yeah. So if, if that's, I mean, if that's how sophisticated uh, things are, you know, who's to say SHA-2 isn't, is, doesn't have some sort of uh, loophole or, or vulnerability that just hasn't been, you know, published yet or made aware of. I, I don't know, but <laughs> It's, yeah, it, it's becoming pretty, you know, pretty difficult when you're using commercial products like that to feel uh, pretty to feel very good about what you're doing. Yeah, I agree because you're you're right. We could find out. We all switch over to SHA two, and then six months later, we're like, oh, this has got a back door. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> because I mean, none of us have the technical expertise to really analyze the algorithm and do the mathematical proofs. I mean, we're absolutely counting on others to tell us it's better and it's sufficient yeah i think our producer probably could but he he might be the closest one out of all of us (laughs) i know i can't (laughs) uh tyler might be able to but he's he he is he's really into that kind of thing so no i know everyone like all those individuals you mentioned are smart but the, the the amount of math that goes into cryptography it is like on a whole other level. Like it, it really is. So yeah. Oh no, no. I, don't get me wrong. I'm saying if if uh, anybody in our circle could do it, those would be the two. Um, and I'm not saying they could. I, I I think they would possibly have the better chance. And I I realize it's high level math, but I've also sat down and listened to Tyler explain these algorithms to me in the past. So. I, I don't know. I know I can't do it. That's for sure. <laughs> no way in hell could I ever do it. So we've just got to put our, our trust in our great overlord, Google, and the NSA and the federal government. So huh. anyway. All, all I have to say about that is politics, 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 politics. Yes. You had to get a plug in for that, didn't you? <laughs> well, it's not technically a plug. I mean, sure. It is if anybody knows what the show is. That, but <laughs> it's, an, it's an appropriate yeah, that's true. thing outside of that context. But yes, the Politics, Politics, Politics show is done by Justin Robert Young for those who are curious. <laughs> yep. I've listened to one. I need to go back and listen to, to some others. But all right. I guess that's where we're going to end this episode wrap it up uh oliver where online can you be found sir uh i can be found at at obanta on twitter cool all right is that is that the correct way of saying that yeah it it, it sounded odd it sounded odd saying at twice though well you can just say i'm obanta on twitter uh, it, it because it's just implied that it's the, the yeah. ad symbol. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Yeah, that's. Implied. I've heard it various different ways on various different shows. So either way, you were correct. <laughs> yeah, I mean, some people will do. Well, you can find me at twitter dot com slash and whatever. So if you just yeah, I always say like me, I'm GD ad kissing on Twitter. So Sam, where can we find you when you're not uh, sitting here chewing the technology fat with us? It's been great to be at this again. And like I said, hopefully it lasts more than two months because I enjoy this anytime we get to do this. Um, if anyone wants to find me, they can find all of the shows, Let's Play stuff I do at tscn.tv. And if they want to find me more personally, all of the ways of getting a hold of me are at about.me slash labtech7. So easy way to find me. Awesome. Awesome. Um, and like I said, I am on Twitter, GD Adkisson. Uh, if you want to call in and leave a message for the show, the number is 313-718-2557, or you can drop feedback, comments, or whatever via email. The email address is don at donovanadkisson.com, or you can leave a comment at the bottom of the post if you happen to be listening to this on the website. And, uh, yep, that's it. That's a wrap. It's been a great show. Um, As Sam said, hopefully we can make this last longer than two months. I've enjoyed it, and the plan right now is to try to uh, do these every Friday uh, if schedules allow. 
uh, about 7.30 p.m., and we do live stream it whenever we do it. So come and join us. Uh, it'll be streamed on slant.fm. Just click the Listen Live link at the top. So until next time, for Oliver and Sam, this has been the Donovan Atkinson Show. We'll catch you later. The Donovan Adkisson Show is a production of the Slant FM Digital Network, which is owned and operated by Adkisson Enterprises, LLC.